An international team of virus experts have said on Thursday that they actually found genetic data from a market in Wuhan, China, that they believe links the coronavirus with animals, raccoon dogs, that had been for sale there. The New York Times reported on that, adding evidence to the theory that COVID-19, their theory, originated from human-animal contact in a wet market. The genetic data was drawn from swabs taken in and around the Huanan seafood wholesale market starting in January of 2020. This was shortly after the Chinese authorities shut down the market due to suspicions that it was linked to the outbreak of the coronavirus. Joining us now to discuss is former CDC director Robert Redfield. Welcome, doctor. Thank you. Thanks for having me. It's our pleasure. So first and foremost, uh, does this new information about uh, the, the swabs that have been taken that show evidence uh, that these raccoon dogs had COVID, uh, the COVID virus, change your estimation of what the origin of the pandemic was? No, I don't think it really adds anything. I think it's important first, they didn't show that the raccoon dogs were actually infected. What they showed was they could have DNA from raccoon dogs on swabs that they also had the COVID virus on. So it's also not unusual for animals, you know, to be infected as opposed to being the intermediate reservoir. For example, you may or may not know in the United States, a substantial number of the white-tailed deer are infected with COVID. Uh, dogs can be infected with COVID. Cats can be infected with COVID. Uh, minks can be infected with COVID. So all they did was show that in the same swab, they had nucleic acid from a, from a raccoon dog and nucleic acid from, uh, from COVID. So you know, the dogs could have been infected. They could not have been infected. They could have just been in the same space where the virus was. The other problem I have with all of this, and I wish these authors, you know, rather than publish in the Atlantic, uh, monthly, they put their data out into a scientific peer-reviewed journal where it could be critically reviewed. Um, I do want to remind people that we have really strong evidence that this pandemic did not start in December, January. It actually started probably somewhere between August and September, uh, August, September, October. So I'm still waiting for the authors, and because they're they're good scientists, they're, they're men of integrity women of integrity, but the reality is they really should retract their proximal origin paper where they say that was the origin of the COVID because they're basically three to four months out of date from when the pandemic really started. You know, Dr. Redfield, you were one of a, a, a prominent government health advisors uh, who came out and, and said, you know, what you thought about the possible lab origin, uh, lab leak origins of COVID, um, a view that was really highly stigmatized, I think, for a long period of time, particularly in the media where, where pol uh, political figures and other health uh, officials who really just raised the possibility of it, um, you know, were, were kind of, were, were, were likened to a, it was a conspiracy theory, that sort of thing. Now that the, the Energy Department has made its conclusion, the FBI as well, that they're expressing you know, low confidence, admittedly, but that it, it, a lab origin being more likely. I'm seeing people discussing it again in the media. What do you make of this period of time where you were really not even allowed to, to express that view in polite society? Well, I think the whole approach, uh, particularly by the leadership of NIH, I've said this before, was antithetical to science. Uh, you know, I stand by my testimony that I did recently, uh, and I know Dr. Fauci, Tony, has some disagreement, but he's incorrect. Uh, and I did speak with him in January and Jeremy Farrar about how important I thought it was that NIH lead a scientific investigation into the two hypotheses, spillover and lab leak, and do it aggressively. Uh, so that we can use science to try to understand what what uh, the origins of this virus was. And instead, rather than lead an open, transparent um, scientific debate where both sides were represented, very rapidly within the first week of February, they went to basically totally support the spillover hypothesis. And you've seen that even with the paper, The Proximal Origin, you, even with the consensus uh, on their phone call, even with a letter in Lancet that referred to people like me as conspirators because I had a different point of view. I will say I expressed my point of view on the White House task force in, in, in January, uh, February of, of 2020. So 
uh, people knew that I was of the view as the head of CDC that it was a reasonable hypothesis that this came from a laboratory and both both hypotheses should be pursued. It was very quick though that uh, the NIH uh, took a very aggressive stance as did many of the scientists that the only acceptable hypothesis was spillover. And unfortunately the media went in. I mean the article that you started out it's not even a scientific article. It's a comment in, 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 in Atlantic Monthly and the New York Times, and yet it becomes major news hmm. as if there's a, a strong bias, in my view, towards trying to promote uh, a spillover hypothesis rather than having what I consider an honest scientific debate where I've always said if people prove that I'm wrong, I thank them hmm. because then I learn something. If you prove to me that I'm right, I'm not as thankful because you didn't teach me anything. <laughs> this, should, this should be a scientific debate, and it hasn't been. It's been a geopolitical decision for a single narrative, which is unfortunate. And well, as I said, it's antithetical to science. And Dr. Redfield, do you think that's because, I think what we're all wondering is, do, do figures like Dr. Fauci, who have been you know, very chief advocates of a certain kind of scientific research that many people are reasonably worried could have contributed to a lab leak type incident with the, the grant funding by the US government that was done and that, that research was conducted in Wuhan, China, is is there a fear that some of the government health scientists and and their and their and their surrogates um, are, have a, have incentive to tamp down lab leak speculation because that impugns their funding priorities and their their view of what kind of science should be done? Yeah, first I want to be very clear because uh, Tony Fauci and I have been colleagues and friends for over forty years. I do believe that Fauci and Collins. Are, work, uh, are working in what they believe is in the best interest of science. Mm -hmm. I happen to totally disagree with them. Uh, they are strong advocates of gain of function research. I'm a strong advocate for a moratorium on gain of function research because I do believe it's m very probable that this pandemic was a direct consequence of science. I do think you're right that there's a strong interest in protecting their view, protecting science, that is protecting gain of function research and thereby trying to shift the debate that this obviously didn't come from the laboratory, this obviously came from nature. Um, and that's really the push. You know, secondarily, you know, you know, and I don't blame the Chinese lab per se, you know, the reality is the U.S. government funded this work. NIH funded it, USAID funded it, the State Department funded it, and the DOD funded it. So. The United States funded the research and the scientific community, largely in America and Europe, fostered the gain of function research, which was the basis for which this virus came. Tony's right that prior to gain of function research, the only way new pathogens came in to the human species was spillover. But now in the presence of gain of function research, where you can take a pathogen into a laboratory and change it, then no longer does the species barrier really define uh, the event in humans. It can actually come. And I do believe the next pandemic, and we're going to have another pandemic, and I think it's going to be the great pandemic. I consider COVID a minor pandemic. The great pandemic is going to come, and normally it would come from spillover. It's going to be bird flu that learns how to transmit to humans and then go human to human. But I think the species barriers are very real. Um, but it's much more probable that it will happen because of gain of function research in a laboratory and then escape and then we're going to have a pandemic with flu, which will be much more brutal uh, to the world than COVID was. Um, doctor, I, I so appreciate you saying that you appreciate being told, you know, that when you're wrong, because then you learn something. I'm wondering if, um, you know, you could share anything that um, you think you were wrong about at the beginning of the pandemic now that you're being quite vindicated on some of the larger questions. Well, I, I was wrong on several things. Um, uh, I didn't make this decision, the broader scientific community, Fauci and others did, to call this, you know, SARS-like. This virus is not SARS-like. SARS basically came from a bat to an intermediate host to humans, but it never learned how to go efficiently human to human. MERS never learned to go efficiently to human to human. This virus immediately mm. was one of the most infectious viruses. So what's the first mistake we made? And I was part of it. Um, my colleague, my counterpart, George Gao, who was the head of CDC in China, 
basically guaranteed me that this virus didn't go human to human. All right, even though I was skeptical when I saw his first uh, uh, 27 cases, because three of them were in clusters, we did come to the conclusion that this virus was also SARS-like in that it only caused disease symptomatically. So I think the first big mistake I made was I was looking for symptomatic infections. And so as a consequence, we told the public health community, look for sick people that had exposure to China and let's test them for the virus. Debbie Birx and I, by the middle uh, end of February said, we got that wrong. This virus largely is asymptomatic. And so that changes the entire public health response because now you can't look for sick people. You've got to figure out another way to diagnose the silent epidemic and that was expanded testing. So I'd say the first mistake that I made and many uh, came along with me was uh, assuming that this virus caused symptomatic infection. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it didn't. And it really formed the basis of our original public health response. You remember when people coming back at airports, we would screen everybody at the airport and we'd ask them if they were sick. Mm -hmm. And if they were sick, we'd, we'd take them aside and evaluate them. And if they weren't sick, we'd let them right go through. Well, we now know that probably three quarters of the people that get COVID don't get sick if they're younger than say the age of 50. Big mistake. There were also problems with early testing, uh, you know, that the CDC was involved with. You've said we're going to have another pandemic, uh, God forbid, worse than COVID. That sounds horrible. Do you think, given the early testing errors that happened with COVID, w would the CDC be, w be better able to gear up in the event of another pandemic so that we, we don't have the, the failures with the tests and things of that nature? Yeah, thanks for bringing it up because this is another area where the media never got it quite right, okay? <laughs> uh, CDC's job was to develop new tests for the public health community of our nation, for the public health labs. And I actually think we should have gotten an award because we developed a test within 10 days of knowing the sequence of this virus. Uh, and that's how we were able to diagnose the first cases, I think on January 21st. Um, uh, that test was never flawed. That test never failed. That test was never not available to any health department in the United States. The only problem is you had to send the blood to CDC. Now, people at CDC decided after the health departments were kind of complaining that they were tired of sending all the blood to CDC, that wouldn't it be nice if we gave them the reagents so they could do their own test. And CDC uh, made the decision then to manufacture the reagents. Uh, uh, the second thing they decided, since they were sending the test away from the mothership, they wanted to be very sure that they wouldn't get false positives. So this test was based on what we call two primer pairs. They decided to add a third primer pair. Well, that third primer pair wasn't vetted to the degree it should have been. And so when they sent the test out that Thursday, uh, and to validate, it was never used by the health departments because they had to prove that it worked. I, my phone started ringing the next day that the test wasn't validating. They were getting low level false positives. And what we learned was that the third uh, primer pair was um, the FDA would argue was contaminated. I argued it may have been a design flaw. We know now it was a design flaw. I can't rule out that it wasn't also contaminated. We then removed the third primer pair and went back to the original test and it's worked ever since and continues to this day. The real problem with testing, and this is really important for the next pandemic, and why does South Korea do so well and we do so poorly? South Korea developed private public partnerships with the diagnostic companies when they had their MERS outbreak. Mm. All right, and so they were in place. We have a CDC that makes lab tests for the hundred or so public health labs, but we don't have a CDC to make lab tests for every hospital in the country or for clinical medicine. That's the job of the private sector. And so what happened was there was no private sector and BARDA never got engaged to bring the private sector in. The private sector didn't get engaged because when MERS, when SARS came, they built a test and then SARS went away. And when MERS came, they built a test and MERS went away. So everyone's saying this is SARS-like, the private sector stayed on the sideline. The other major flaw, which was, I got uh, Steve Hahn to change, the FDA had decided that they didn't want any laboratory developed test. They want to regulate laboratory developed tests. I ran laboratories my career and I developed a lot of laboratory tests that I used to help die and treat my patients. So we assumed 
that the molecular labs at Harvard and you know, Mass General, you know, in, in Seattle, San Francisco, they would all chime in because we published our primer pairs. We published the method. We didn't patent it. We figured all the big, you know, diagnostic labs in the hospitals would go ahead and start providing testing for people. But that didn't happen because the FDA made it very clear that they were going to come down hard on anybody that used a lab developed test. So that was another flaw. Dr. Redfield, uh, I, I want to get you before we run out of time with you to just respond to a recent appearance by uh, Dr. Fauci on News Nation's Cuomo, uh, with, with News Nation's Cuomo. He responded to your testimony concerning the very early days of the pandemic. Let's take a quick look. Well, you know, it's really sad, Chris, that he's wrong on every single account, but you don't need to take my word for it. You take the word for the people. He's saying that the phone call to discuss the possibility that this might have been engineered, that I was in charge of the phone call and I deliberately excluded him because his, his ideas differed from what he interpreted were mine. Well, first of all, he had no idea what my ideas were because I kept a completely open mind. Secondly, I was not responsible. I didn't include or exclude anybody from the call because the people that were responsible for setting up the call were Jeremy Farrar from the Wellcome Trust in the UK, Eddie Holmes from, uh, from Australia, and a, and a bunch of other very competent evolutionary virologist. So for, for him to say, and it's sad that he's so wrong and, and he's publicly saying that, that I excluded him. Now, the other thing that's important, he's saying that I excluded him because his idea was different from my idea and his idea was that it came from a lab. Well, half the people on the call felt it might be from a lab. So, Dr. Redfield, what do you make of that response from Dr. Fauci? Well, first, I, I stand by my testimony. I talked to Tony in January, as I said before, and Jeremy Farrar independently about the importance for us to have a scientific investigation into the two hypotheses and to have it rigorous, transparent investigation into the, to the two hypotheses. And I made it clear, you know, that I, as a virologist, Tony's an immunologist, as a virologist, I favored the lab leak for a variety of different reasons. And um, uh, I didn't say that Tony deliberately excluded me. I said I was not included in the call. Now, I can guarantee you that Fauci was very involved in who was on that call. And Jeremy Farrar was working very closely with him, as they did for the Lancet letter, as they did for the paper, The Proximal Origin of AIDS. So there's no question. And the other thing I'll just say, within three or four days, if he had so many people that believed what I believed as a hypothesis, that were so in, engaged in that hypothesis, within three or four days, they all changed and they did a consensus report that the, this uh, the laboratory leak was not, not in the cards. It couldn't have happened. It had to be a spillover event. So I disagree with Tony. I'm sad he didn't provide the scientific leadership that he should have provided as the head of NIID to have this transparent investigation of both hypotheses. He should have put together teams to go after both hypotheses and it should have been open, transparent, rigorous scientific debate. It didn't happen. Instead, there was a very concerted effort uh, to come to a single narrative. Now, I'm not going to tell you who on the call told me that, you know, that how they went to a single narrative. And they, I'm not going to say who said that, you know, one of the reasons certain people weren't included like me is they were convinced that I wouldn't agree to a single narrative. But the fact is they came out with a single narrative in three days. So you're, and, you're saying that the reason, because it seemed like what Dr. Fauci was saying was that you don't know his mens rea, you don't know what he really believed or what how he was leaning, but you're saying that you had a conversation with somebody else who was a participant on the call uh, who told you that the reason that you were in fact excluded, excluded and the reason was because you were inclined to believe. Uh, I, another member, another theory. member said they wanted a single consensus and I wasn't there. But I know what Tony felt because we argued it out in the um, White House task force. And you can read Pre Vice President Pence's book. He even says Fauci guaranteed him that it didn't come from the lab. It came from Spiro, but Redfield felt it came from Spiro, um, from a lab. It was all discussed within the White House task force. It just wasn't discussed publicly. So can you give us and, a sense uh, of... Of, of what what was Fauci saying to you? Why, how was he pushing back against you as you were he advocating? He said it was a spillover. He said it was absolutely a spillover. Go back and watch all his, you know, one thing Tony has, 
that I don't have in those days. He has a lot of media time. And just <laughs> yeah. go back and, and go back and play what he said. Okay, but go back people, and play what he said. I think he said are interested. this was spillover. I think people are interested, Dr. Bedfield, and and because you you obviously are very knowledgeable about this, and there, people are interested in in kind of what his off camera response might have meant to someone like yourself, who was confronting him with direct factual a uh, direct factual basis for why you think the lab leak read, origin yeah, was read, more read, viable. Read Vice, yeah, read Vice President Pence's book. He says it very clearly. Clearly, that I said that it, it came from the lab. Tony guaranteed him that it was a spillover event. Dr. Redfield, I think a lot of people might say, well, okay, we don't know exactly for sure which of these two hypotheses it is. Uh, policy, maybe policy changes should happen to guard against to, uh, both of them. Perhaps, you know, if we, if there were, we, we, there's only maybe so much we can do about wet mar open wet markets in, in China, but if, if we had them in the U.S., we would close them. Uh, we would also maybe renew the moratorium on gain-of-function research, which expired in 2018. My understanding is some exceptions were granted anyway under that moratorium. Um, Dr. Fauci was was deposed on this issue and, and, and gave some inclination that he might have personally signed off on some exceptions. But now that moratorium no longer exists. Do you think we should re-implement a moratorium on this research like today? Yeah, I mean, the reason that I've taken the position that I've taken, you know, I, I just prefer to stay out of the public eye and been there, done that. But I took this position because I feel very strongly that we need to have a moratorium on gain of function research. I told you that the great pandemic is coming. I think it's going to come not from spillover. It's going to become from gain of function research or intentional bioterrorism, right? It's going to be a bird flu virus that is manipulated to be able to transmit human to human, very similar to what we saw with the COVID. You know, in 2014, that laboratory published that they finally learned how to take their COVID virus and have it bind to the H2 receptor in humanized mice and therefore it could go human to human. I mean, they did the experiments, they published them in, in 2014. And, and now we see that there's a COVID virus, which is, I think, has a n number of signature sequences in it that aren't normal. The fear and cleavage site, the fact that they use the nucleotide triplet for arginine that humans use, not bats use, the fact that COVID right now can barely infect bats, but it can infect humans, I should tell you that there's a lot of evidence that this virus was manipulated to be able to be highly transmissible among humans. I think it was done probably as part of a biodefense program that largely was trying to make a vaccine vector that would be used for good purposes. But unfortunately, that virus escaped and it was highly transmissible for humans and you saw from the time it escaped, which was probably somewhere in the September time frame. You remember in September, that laboratory did three things. They changed the uh, management from the, military, uh, the civilian to military. They deleted all the sequences of the viruses and they put a contract in for a new ventilation system. That's about the same time uh, they began to see some illness in the area. So I think that's when the epidemic started. And um, I do think the gain of function research moratorium is something should happen. It shouldn't be decided just by scientists. I happen to be a scientist, but we shouldn't decide this ourselves. There should be a broader debate of society whether this research needs to be done or not. Tony will argue it needs to be done. Collins will argue it needs to be done. Um, I think that debate should happen. And if the answer for society is we need to do the research because the potential good is greater than any harm, then we should figure out how do we do it in a safe, responsible, and effective way. But right now, this research is being done in university laboratories all over the world. And again, I'll go on record, you know, don't like to say it. My parents were scientists. It, it hurts me to say this. But I do believe that the most likely answer when we get to the truth is that this pandemic was caused by science, not by a natural spillover event. Mm. Oh, Dr. Redfield, thank you so much for joining us today. We really appreciate it. All right. Thanks for having me. God bless. Bye-bye. More rising right after this.